Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of the JMAC Podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is brought to you by orgorich.com and attack.e. Use my promo code JMAC Podcast to get 15% off on orgorich.com and get the best games, gloves and equipment on attack.e. Be attack-minded. And if you like what you're seeing, like and subscribe on YouTube. The support's been absolutely brilliant so far. At tonight, I'm joined by former cabin footballer Mickey Allen to talk about his career, his current uh, coaching situation with Longford Senior Footballers and the current GA State of Affairs. Lots going on and lots to talk about. So Mickey, how are you keeping Good, John. Yeah, very busy, but I'm, relatively speaking, I'm on midterm this week, so it's uh, it's meant to be a down week. But my my young fellow was sick all week, so I thought he'd be in the vice versa. Fresh, same as, same as uh, so I spent actually the first four days uh, nursing him. I thought I'd get loads of work done, but uh, that's just the way life rolls sometimes for you. But yeah, generally good. It's good to have a have a break from the madness. Yeah, yeah, you and me both, Biggie, you and me both. And I suppose, uh, how's life? How's, how's everything getting on? Obviously, you're um, with Billy, Billy O'Loughlin with the Longford Senior Footballers this year. So, are you enjoying that so far? Yeah, incredibly busy, but enjoying it. Yeah, I have to say, it's, it's been eye opening the, the length of time it takes up in every week. It's, uh, it's a big commitment. It wouldn't 55 hours every week wouldn't wouldn't surprise me if if you go above 55 hours in terms of the commitment it requires. So, um, you know, we're for a relatively young team, I suppose. Um, I'm talking about the management team here now, not even the players. <laughs> they're, they're extremely young, the, the, the group of players that we have, but the management team, we're, we're learning as we go along. and it's, it's enjoyable, lots to learn. And, you know, you can see, see uh, kind of the, the development of the team too in places. It's, it's just going to take a little bit of time because the age profile that we have is so young. 10 lads that are, are 20 years or younger. And, uh, we're missing a kind of in that key age group of like 23 to 29 year olds. We, we, we don't have too many of those lads involved. Uh, we've only a handful, three or four, I think, in total. And then we have a few lads that are 30 and 31 and stuff. So very young. Most of the most of the panelists, 23, 22, 21 or 20 with a couple of 19 year olds there. So it's a, it's a young group of players, but they're, they're eager to learn and they're they're at that age where they're impressionable and they're, they're able to take on everything that you're saying and they're, they're, they're keen to improve so yeah it's, it's been good so far Cheers Mickey, happy days I suppose you're enjoying it all obviously kind of cutting your teeth into the inter-county uh, management scene obviously we were talking off air at the ins and outs but so obviously Longford's in Division 3 um, obviously they got uh, promotion last year from um, or is it yeah promotion last year so they're, they are flying so is it like you have to be involved and kind of cut your teeth Yeah well last year was the was the shortened league, the truncated league. So they, they stayed in Division Three. They got promoted the year before, yeah. um, and then last year they they uh, they they only had a couple of games or whatever, like like most counties. So yeah, they they uh, stayed up last year in the round robin system. The way it worked out. So it's a very different team this year to last year, though. You know, I think seven of last year's team is gone, and maybe another three or four of the panels. So there's a there's a huge turnover. But I'm uh, you know when I got. I got a phone call from Billy to get involved. I, um, he hadn't even got the job. He just said he was going for the interview. Would I get involved? So I kind of thought to myself, sure. How often do you get a chance to to work with an intercounty team? You know, and it's one of the things I've known over the years working with different panels, groups of players. Like working with pl good players is addictive. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's very rewarding compared to working with with an average player. So working anybody working at the intercounty levels. <laughs> Well, it, it's a very privileged position. Like to work with a, a, a good group of players is is a privilege, really. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, anybody in, involved in intercounty coaching at any level, whether that's development squads or underage or senior intercounties, it's it's a privilege to, to to get to work with that caliber of players. You know, and I know different. I'm enjoying it. I've I've seen both sides of the the, the coin working with good groups and working with with players maybe that aren't at that level and. It's certainly rewarding when you're working with a good group. Working with any group, improving them is, is very, very rewarding. But obviously, there is a kick when you work with players and you can see some of the things that they can do. And even the way they might grasp concepts maybe a little bit better. And the football IQ could be strong with, with a technical ability and physical ability. Um, you know, it, it does. It, there's a kick involved with it. You can't say there's not. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say no sometimes when, you, when an opportunity like that is presented to you. 
for Mickey Devlin. Obviously, like, uh, what, have, what have you made of this season so far? Obviously, three games into the league and obviously games will be pulled and bits and pieces like that, Mickey. So, are you supposed to be happy with the uh, long for start of the league so far? Yeah, well, we, we've played two because we, our game last week got, got pulled because of the rain. We meant to be playing Westmead. So, we've only played two games. We, we played poorly the first day. Well, wouldn't even say we played poorly. We played poorly for 15 minutes and uh, Limerick really blew us apart at times. Physically, very strong team. And uh, second day out against Louds, again, didn't probably start well in the first half, but played well in the second half and, and, and got a point. And I'm lucky probably not to get two points. The referee found eight minutes of stoppage time when he said there was only going to be five. So we were one point up and <laughs> Loud then equalised with the, with the last kick of the game from a free, brilliant free, I have to say, but disappointed not to get all two points there. But yeah, Division three is very kind of competitive. There's a lot of teams that can take points off each other. You know, it doesn't take much to be looking behind you or to be looking uh, above you. Uh, you can go either way in the next couple of matches. So you pick up a few points. If, if we were to win at the weekend or, uh, you know, remain on, or let's even draw at the weekend, you, you'd be staring up the top of the table saying, yeah, we, our fate's in our own hand here. You could still get, get promoted, but you lose suddenly you're looking the other way so it's kind of the key round coming up you know and a couple of matches weren't played in in division uh, three so there's a lot of kind of unknowns yet so look it's all to play for but i suppose we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens at the weekend but like in terms of enjoying the, pro the process so far yeah i have to say it's been really really enjoyable getting a lot out of it and uh, learning a lot of them as i'm going along you know Great stuff, Mickey. Great stuff. And I suppose, obviously, the time that goes into it, Mickey, and obviously the commitment is probably like being a player, you're involved again, like the ins and outs, it's probably on your mind 24-7. And obviously, we all have to mix the family life and the sport and everything goes with it, Mickey. So, you know, it is a huge commitment. But I suppose, Mickey, that's what it takes to be successful. Yeah, well, I said, to, I I genuinely didn't think, uh, you know, when Billy approached me about getting involved, he hadn't got the job. I, I genuinely didn't think that, he, he, you know, that he was going to end up getting it. I just thought he's a bit of a rookie, a bit young, but obviously Longford were, were looking for something like that. So I had said to him, we'll, we'll prepare you as well as we can, Billy, for the interview, and we'll see how it goes. And sure, do as well as he can so that maybe in two or three years' time they'll remember you. Uh, and he was like, yeah, fair enough. So uh, lo and behold, he got the job. I had to turn around to my wife, who I told, <laughs> who I said, don't worry, darling, you know, you're going to be seeing plenty of me. Plenty of me. <laughs> I don't think uh, this is gonna gonna materialise. So then suddenly I had to turn around to her and say, "Actually, by the way, <laughs> good luck. I'm out the door here." So uh, yeah, like I mean, it's it is tough. There is a strain of family life that way. I mean, you can't whether you're a player or involved in management, you, you just can't do it without support at home. Um, if you if 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 you don't get that kind of support from from your partner and your family and stuff like that, it's very difficult to be involved. At this level, um, I mean, 55 hours a week, kind of like management, it definitely takes up more time than playing. I, I can say that. <laughs> like when you leave the field as a as a player, you have one or two things to focus on, um, but you know, uh, as a as a manager or you know, in management and training and all that kind of stuff, coaching, like it's you're up to maybe two o'clock in the morning putting together things together and planning sessions and doing stuff like that. So yeah, it's time consuming, but like. You know, it's it's enjoyable. I mean, you you, you have to enjoy it to, to do it. It takes up such an amount of time. So I'm not complaining here by any stretch of the means. Like, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could do this all day, every day, you know. Um, so I, I, I do enjoy it, yeah. But it is, it is you do, uh, you know, have to make agreements with the, with the wife and the child and say, right, definitely this Saturday afternoon or, you know, if you have a game Saturday, then it's Sunday, all day Sunday, it's set aside for family. Yeah, you have to do it. Otherwise, um, that support just might be there the following week when you need it. So, yeah, but like it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of balls in the air that you're trying to juggle, but uh, that just comes with the territory. It does indeed, Mickey. It does indeed. She, uh, she must be very understanding. That's <laughs> what I can judge from it. And of course, Mickey, uh, Cavan, your native county. Uh, we are a couple of games into the league campaign so far. We have played um, Leitrim and Wexford and Sligo last weekend was pulled. So are you happy with the progression of the Cavan footballers at the minute? And I suppose yeah, the general consensus is, I fully Mickey. expect Cavan to march out of that division. Yeah. It's, I think it was an anomaly that they got relegated based on the fact that the season was so truncated last year. Um. 
you know, they they played uh, for Mana and they played most of that game with, I think they had two or three black cards in the game. So they played most of that, that match a man down. They should have probably won that game to be in a full strength. Um, then they, uh, you know, the Wicklow game, that was a poor performance, a poor opening 20 minutes of that game. And after that, they were they were the better team for, for a good portion of it. So, like, you know, it, it happens sometimes. You know, I, I, I don't think they, they're, they're a Division 4 team. I think if you were to rank in the counties in, in, in Ireland, Cavan are probably somewhere 12 or 13th in, in, in the country. So they've developed a lot of strength and depth on their panel. Um, probably a bit, of a, a bit of a gamble the way Mickey Graham went about it. But it certainly, he won an Ulster title at the same time, but he was using an Ulster final. I think he only used 17 players. So if you looked at the bench in the Ulster final, there was a lot of young lads there, and they've kind of been developing them, them over the last 18 months. So the capital are in a good place, I think. I think they're going to come out of, out of uh, that division fairly handily. Um, don't want to put the, the, the crux on them now. But <laughs> I think they'll, I think they'll mark. I use the choose these words delicately. I think they'll march out of Division Four. No, but I do think they'll they, they'll come out of it. Um, they'll top the group. I think, and they, they, they'll come out of it. I think there there's too much quality in that team. Like you still have Grove McKernan playing at an extremely high level. Yeah. Poor Faulkner to me is arguably the best the best um, pound for pound player in the county and one of the best in Ulster. Um, they've got a lot of lot of things going for them. So yeah, I, I I'd say they'll come out and. Uh, like if they do, and I'm still involved with Longford next year, and we're in Division Three, it's <laughs> a tough week that week. But uh, no, but like, uh, yeah, they're they're going well. Yeah, it's good to see. I mean, they 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 kind of have an opportunity now with the experience of winning that Ulster title. They kind of have an opportunity to maybe um, you know reach a couple more Ulster finals again. And if they've, if they've done that over maybe this year or next year, it, it, you'd make a grain could look back at his four or five years involved and he, he'd have probably have racked up as impressive CV as any cabin manager would have over the last 40 years. So, yeah, and it's it's a good time for them, I think. They just, they need to they need to get back up into Division 2 or Division 1 fairly handily, fairly quickly. Dead right, you're dead right. So, so have you been to any of the games? You, I suppose you're you impressed with the kind of quality and speaking to a lad during the week. I suppose it is kind of hard to get kind of uh, excited, I suppose, about some of these games. I know we are playing Carlo this Sunday in Breffney Park at two o'clock, Mickey. But, you know, I suppose the analysis, uh, the, the, the talk about them is very bleak at the minute. But look, they're going about their business and they're getting the job done, I suppose, Mickey. Yeah, people generally, you know, get carried away too quickly. <laughs> with both directions and when there's good stuff there they they get too excited and when there's a little bit of negativity they get they get too down but like you know last year i think was an anomaly the way the league was if that had been a seven game league Cavan probably would have got promoted and Cavan were fairly close to getting promoted back to division one the year they got relegated down to division <laughs> division three like claire turned things around in the last few minutes and you know things swung drastically from Cavan going back to the, being a Division 1 team to suddenly being in Division 3. But they, they showed that year by winning Ulster the, the kind of level that they're at. So I I wouldn't be, you know, just anyone talking negatively at the moment just has a bit of a bee in their bonnet. You know, I, I, I wouldn't kind of uh, succumb to that train of thought. I think there's been a lot of good young players coming in. Um, I think like any group of young players, it takes some time to, to find their, their feet. No matter how good you are, it still takes you about 10 matches to kind of accustom, get accustomed to the level of inter-county football. Um, I probably would worry about the level Calvin will play the championship at this year because they played Division 4 this year. Um, I think it's very important that they probably try to organise some high-quality challenge matches before the championship starts. Like if they could play a couple of Division 1 teams in, in April, that would really kind of uh, set them up because those good players that played Division One and a huge cohort of the panel played Division One for a number of years and won an Ulster title. Like if those lads can just get reaccustomed to, the, to playing against Division One teams again, I think when they get, go back into Ulster, uh, they, they'll they'll up their level again. You know, so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be too negative about it. Uh, what can I say about Carlo? I mean, we, we played Carlo. I think Carlo in a bit a bit of a mess at the moment. We we played them in a challenge match and we weren't um overly impressed with them, I'd say, at the start of the year. They they look like one of those teams that's maybe um, in a bit of transition at the moment as well. Um sometimes they, they they had Stephen Poacher there for a number of years and they had a very clear game plan when he was coaching the team and 
that's gone now a little bit and I think they're trying to trying to find themselves again and it could be it could be another 18 months or so before they kind of get their act together and uh, when they try a different approach slightly so yeah I, I, I'd expect expect Cavan to win that again you know Absolutely, I suppose. I suppose your mindset on that as well, Mickey. And obviously, I've been speaking to a number of the Cavan fans in recent months, and they're kind of thinking it's an awful pity. And I know Mickey Graham has vocally kind of said he doesn't have a great care deal for the league. So I suppose that kind of came up to haunt us to a degree because, like a football mad county, you've seen the celebrations when we won the 2020 Ultra Championship, the fans, the cars, everything, Mickey. So, you know, this is a result of that, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know now. Mickey might have said that, but no one. <clears throat> Mickey, I don't know how true that would have been. I, I'd say <clears throat> certainly he mightn't have cared too much about whether they were in Division 1 or Division 2, but I wouldn't say he was happy the year they went down to Division 3. And certainly last year, I doubt he was happy now them going down to Division 4. I mean, like, that was never part of the plan to take a Division 1 team all the way down to Division 4, even if they did win an Ulster title en route. Um, so, I mean, he, 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 he will be trying to get them back up to Division 2 or Division 1 as quick as he can, like, so... And it's it's on the cards like that that you know you see Derry at the moment you know they're they're flying it absolutely flying it and they took a couple of steps back and they they have some really good underage teams and they really took care of those boys over the last two years in terms of develop, developing them physically and they've marched from Division Four back to Division Two they look like they're going into Division One and um, and they they they're an outside bet for Ulster a lot of a lot of um, people are fancying Derry actually to win Ulster even if you have the All Ireland champions. Um, Tyrone in, in in the province, it's uh, people are looking at Derry as a as a kind of coming force over the next few years. So, you know, Cavan are kind of in that same situation. Even if they did win in Ulster, they they look to get a lot of young players onto the panel, and it just takes time. Those lads will be different after ten matches. You know, once they play ten games, inter county football, national league competitive games, they'll be a different, very different player. They'll have learned a lot. So, that kind of the campaign and a half and kind of saw, you know, last year wasn't a full campaign. It wasn't even half a campaign. It was three games and then a match against Tyrone, you know. So it's yeah. uh, it's it, COVID certainly and messed up the development of a lot of a lot of groups of players and probably prolonged it. Uh, sorry, slowed down the development of, of, of a group of lads there, you know. Even see, see it in Longford there with all the, the young lads on the panel, like they they didn't have gym sessions there they, for two years. They weren't those two crucial years of being under 20 when they should have been probably introduced to lifting, um, not even introduced, I mean, they should have been doing that earlier, but certainly by under 20, a lot of lads, by the time they're coming out of minor, they're 18, 19 year olds, they start really focusing in on S&C work. And all of that was just didn't happen because you couldn't get guys collectively together to show them what to do. You had coaches, S&C coaches that couldn't travel more than five kilometers. Uh, you d didn't have a gym, you know, the gym was broken up and like senior players would have went and took the weights out of the gym. So there was no facility there. <laughs> so I can see that there's yeah. a lot of things for, for la lads in that age group have had to deal with a lot of stuff over the last few years. And unless the county was super organized and had uh, a lot of money and a, lo a lot of resources, you know, it would have affected affected their uh, their development over those years. So, yeah, I... I, I uh, I don't know. I think Cavan are kind of—they're not in a bad place. They're, they're they're going in the right direction, and it's just going to take a, a matter of time. It's—I'd expect them to get promoted this year, and I think they'll they'll be even stronger next year. Um, and you know, depends really. Uh, like if M Mickey Graham, one thing you have to hand him to him—he's very good at kind of getting the team up for a championship game. You know, I think that's when he said he doesn't care about the league. That's probably what he, he's realised. It's very hard to get a team up every single week to kind of play above themselves every single week because emotionally then it becomes a bit stale and it's very hard to do that, you know. So even you see a team like maybe Monaghan that has survived in Division 1 for so long, they probably pick and choose the games that they're going to get themselves really, really up for and they probably yeah. target target a number of games, and you, you don't need to win seven games to stay up. Like you only need to win maybe two and draw one. Five points can keep you up there. So out of your seven games, you might pick and say those three are the ones that we're really going to target. So yeah, look, Mickey, I think he's done a good job, and um, of course he's, he's refreshed his backroom team as well this year. He's brought in different coaches as well. So. He's probably aware that he has to keep things fresh and stop things from going stale. Yeah. So 
yeah, no, he's he's on he's on the ball with a lot of things he's doing. I think. Definitely, and that's was my next question. So, was Mickey, and um, he, he does at the backroom team now. Johnny Johnson's gone into the forest coach. Racy McBen was there, and obviously Jeremy McCabe uh, left the panel from last year. So, it's it is probably a case of maybe leaving no stone left unturned. Mickey, kind of getting the full deck of cards. We've seen the McKenna Cup teams, the panels. It was the strongest we've probably had in McKenna Cup in the last couple of years. So, Mickey, it's a real case of just all hands on deck. Yeah, and like you know, the the coaching thing is important there. Like. Uh, just guys coming in with fresh ideas and, and a fresh perspective. Um, you know, like Shawnee, Shawnee, I think is coming in to work nearly exclusively with the, with the four, well, I mean, I'd say forwards, but it's nearly with exclusively with the attack. Um, so, you know, overall his years of playing football and even I see him there, like I teach with Shawnee. So, you know, I see him working with the underage teens in the school. You know, he'll have, he'll have ideas about how he wants to do things and, and, uh, you know, he'll have a good good command on the field and stuff when he when he's coaching. So, yeah, it's it's a good move by by um, by Mickey. You know, uh, even then Ryan coming in to to Ryan McMahon coming in to work at the other end. Like Ryan has huge experience when you think that he managed from Anna. First of all, he coached from Anna under Rory with, with Rory Gallagher. So Rory, all the experience Rory would have had from co- managing uh, Donegal and then coaching under Jim McGuinness previously to that. So you know, there's a there's a kind of all this information is being passed around, you know, secondhand, spreading on to people. So, I mean, everybody's bringing something to the table there. So, it's been it's been a very good move by Mickey to to freshen things up. Again, though, with anything, it takes time for ideas to bed down, and that to me, I think, is one of the benefits actually of Calvin at the moment. That even when things haven't fully clicked, just purely on the basis that they probably have superior athletes in a lot of positions to a lot of the teams in Division Four. They're going to win games even even if the all the coaching hasn't clicked yet and it probably won't click in the first year so you know they'll, they'll they should come out of that division and it, it could be next year before you really see the the results of uh, the new coaches you know absolutely and I suppose did you get to see any of the games did you get to go to the Leitrim game or the Wexford game or like were you impressed by so, anything you know? I, I, I've just been tuning in, reading the paper and stuff, listening on the radio. I, ha- I haven't got to go to a single game. There was one game I could have went because it didn't clash with, with, with a Longford game, but I had <laughs> made promises here about uh, <laughs> what we were doing that day, so I, I couldn't get the passport that stamped that day to, to head to the game, you know? So uh, it's funny, it's one of the things I'm missing about COVID, like <laughs> if there's something you can miss about COVID was... <laughs> Games were being streamed, and if you could, you know, you couldn't yeah, travel. Yeah, yeah. Could see everything, and um, yeah. it's just not, it's just not available now. You know, uh, to to watch in, in in that that format. So why is that, Mickey? Like, uh, uh, Matty Ford was saying that to me during the week. Like, it's madness. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would have thought it would have completely opened up a whole new revenue stream for the GAA. Like, you know, uh. Maybe they're they're just they try to protect their their gate receipts, but it, it certainly would have made made um, sense uh, to uh, to to probably open up streams, you know, online streams to 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 people that can't get to the games. But I don't know. You have to talk. Older there. generation. Oh, Older generation. Yeah, people I, sick. Yeah. yeah. So the like the one of the issues I see with the GAA is that they don't have their media rights. And their competition structure is aligned. So when a competition changes, it's stuck. Even though there's a different amount of games, maybe it's stuck to a previous, uh, you know, a previous media agreement or a television rights deal. So you know, if for example, when they knew the Super Eights were coming in, there should have been a new television agreement coming in as well. But the tele- they had to use the old television agreement to cover the Super Eights when 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 that happened. So there is a. <clears throat> probably an appetite for, for and you see this in, in, in America, let's say with all the different sports, whether it's the NBA or whether it's uh, the NFL or whatever it is, like even for example, college basketball, they have, they have niche markets and local, local media and they, they have national agreements as well. And yeah, it's probably something that will come down like fragmentation of markets is, um, you know, it's inevitable really in, in, in all, all spheres. And, you know now I'm talking like using my media degree here, <laughs> two degrees <laughs> in the media. So. <laughs> I'll stick to the football, but yeah, no, like y- y- you can see that that 
it, it's an opportunity probably missed that maybe they're thinking, OK, we have to align the structures of our competitions with the timing of our television deals so that we can actually serve all these markets. So the next, basically, the next television deal uh, is an interesting one. Do they go for something stupid like five years when they know the competitions are going to change? Or do they say, right, let's just do a two year deal so that maybe we can align everything down the line, schedule things better? So, yeah, but definitely there's an appetite. There's an appetite there. And a and, and niche market, getting smaller in niche markets is kind of, um, kind of the way a lot of things are going in, in media. Absolutely, Mickey, absolutely. And I suppose we can touch on to your own career. Obviously, you uh, represented Calvin for a number of years, uh, Dragoon and Bally Bay. So you've kind of skinned uh, skin and, skin and the game in um, a couple of counties there, Mickey. So did you enjoy your uh, days of playing for Calvin like over the years? And obviously, obviously the eyes and the prize was also maybe a nice title, but did you enjoy it? Yeah, like, I mean, some great memories and some great friends made. You know, I w- would have loved to have won or something, obviously, but it wasn't to be. Uh, like... You know, I was just chatting to one of the Longford players about this, like, uh, so, you know, the culture at the time when, I suppose I kind of came into the Calvin panel in 2002, let's say, and they had, you know, a lot of the panel had won an Ulster title in 97 and things were changing, like Armagh had come along 2002 and um, 2003, those kind of years and had really, really from 99 Armagh came along, were changing things in terms of the S&C end of things. And um uh, they, they took things to a new level and for a lot long time it it was hard for other counties to kind of catch up and realize the, the level or the the consistency that was required with snc uh, i suppose i spent a lot of my years on the panel kind of seeing this but nearly being on my own in terms of didn't not on my own but the you were fighting a culture where you had lads that just thought that, oh, well, we can just play football. That's, you know, we know how to play football. Why do we need to do all this other stuff versus, you know, guys coming along like me that were like saying, well, hold on. These guys are getting stronger, bigger, faster than us every year. We need to be doing, uh, really need to be doing this SNC work and not just one or two of us. We need to, everybody needs to buy into this stuff uh, in order to compete. And then I was chatting to one of the Longford lads, like YouTube didn't exist until like 2004, 2005. Like if you wanted to find out something, it was so hard. I remember going into into the college in DCU and going through the, the books, picking up the sports science books on, um, you know, strength work. And this was what I was doing because we might get a SNC work and it might come in and you might do SNC work and then, um, I'll never forget, actually, I remember a group of players complained in March of 2003 that they were too tired, they were too fatigued from the, the weights and they didn't want to be lifting weights anymore. So the weights all got pulled. So our, our access to gyms was all gone because a group of lads didn't feel. And there's truth in that, it, like doing the work does create fatigue, but you need to condition yourself. You need to buy into it for a year so that suddenly you're not fatigued anymore, you know. So, um. You know, you wanted to learn something then, you needed to actually go away and teach yourself and educate yourself. And you didn't have the resources that, that let's say, lads have now. If you want to learn how to Olympic lift, you can do a course on it. You can do an online course. You can look at videos, teach yourself. But like, literally, you had none of that. You were reading a book, some Russian book with some guy <laughs> with a picture and you're trying to figure out how to do these lifts and how to better yourself. So I would say, and. Also nutrition, like nutrition wasn't what it was today. You, did, you know, everything was all chicken and pasta and it was 90% pasta and 10% chicken. Well, it should be the other way around really, you know? So it, it was bits of information, a little bit of education is a dangerous thing. So I always kind of look back at my career and kind of go, well, you know, I, I, I nearly, I would say athletically I'm performing better when I reach 31, 32, 33, 34 than I did for a large portion of my year prime because, um, you know, just basically education wise, uh, I, I would have improved and been able to make those gains into my 30s that I wasn't making when I was in my 20s. Because, for example, diet wasn't on point or uh, overtraining, do, doing the wrong kind of lifting because uh, the programming wasn't there consistently throughout the year, you know. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed it, but I kind of look back at it now and kind of go, yeah, you didn't you didn't hit hit the heights that you should have hit in your prime for you know a whole host of reasons that maybe 
Um, you know, certainly I feel I could impart that knowledge now to other people at that stage of their careers to, to put them on the right path. So I, I definitely enjoyed it, but there's always that tinge of, well, you didn't you, you didn't really play consistently at the level that you could have played at. Um, and that kind of kind of annoys me a little bit now at this stage of my career. You know, I, for example, I, I wear a GPS device when I'm training even now at Bally Bay. And I, even at this stage of my career, I can see my, my speed and is increasing every single year. You know, obviously, as you get older, your ability to recover slows down. But I can see that I'm hitting new top speed every single year. That's because there's been a consistency mm. with my training and diet over the last decade that I wouldn't have maybe had in the first decade and purely based on knowledge and education at this stage. So, yeah, look, I always look back at my, my county years and I was very young when I went in. I was 18, um, you know, probably maybe too young in hindsight, but I, I look back at them. What year did you start, Mickey? So Matty Kerrigan took me in. So I actually done my first training session. I was 17. I was about to turn 18 a week later when I when I went in to do my first training session. So Matty Kerrigan was now he must have been that must have been 0102. Eamon Coleman came in in 04. He was there 04 and 05, uh, 04 and 05. So yeah. So uh, a lot of miles in the clock since then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I always kind of look back at it now with a little tinge of kind of well. I didn't probably get as the most out of me that I could have got, you know. Um, but still, really enjoyed it. Certainly, some of the friends I would have met, um, you know, so you make you, when you are with a group of lads for so long, you know, of so much of your time spent with them, you know, away from the field as well because you're up in college or in Dublin or whatever it was, and you just seem to be with, hanging out with guys, you know, sixteen or seventeen hours of the day. Uh, you, you form good good bonds that, that have lasted all these years later, you know. So, yeah, really, don't regret it. You know, don't regret it at all. Um, but it is it is outside of coaching or managing a <laughs> intercounty team, playing for one is the next most time consuming thing I think someone can do in this country. It's uh, it's a big commitment. Massive, massive. Obviously, them early years, and I was talking to Finn Barr earlier there a few weeks ago, and he was talking about some of the managers and Eamon Coleman to name one, Mickey. Uh, what a man, what a manager, what a motivator. Yeah, and he, Coleman had that, like one of the things with any manager is you have to have control, and like he, I've never seen a man control a group of players as well as Eamon could control them, you know. He just had that edge to him where, and like he had that kind of, he had a soft streak in him too where he could, you know, you know, you could, he could, he had a nice side where he could, sometimes the fear of God would be in you. You see him walking across the pitch, cap could be off his head, he could be ringing the cap and you're thinking, oh Jesus, what have I done now? And then other times you'd see maybe, uh, you know, he could chat to you about his horses, for example. He talked about the horses that he had. He loves, you could talk for an hour then about the horses. Uh, so he had, he had definitely, uh, he had that ability to control things and control a group that I've uh, I've never really seen with a, with a manager since, you know. Um, and that's, I suppose, that's one of the key things for any manager is to be able to control the group, you know, but you, you have to be yourself. Uh, you know, whatever your style is, yeah, you can't try to impose or become someone different. I, and I've seen that too in, in teaching. You're, you have to, you're teaching in a classroom, you have to have a level of control. Uh, you have to maintain that tension with the group in order to keep that control. But at the same time, you can't you can't be someone that you're not because you you'll burn out trying to be someone that you're not. You know, if you're too militant or you're too if it's not your personality, it's not going to work. So, uh, so it came naturally to him, and <laughs> he, he was uh, he was good, and he was he was a great reader of players, like. Uh, a great man to give someone confidence, you know, could really make you feel like you're capable of, yeah, I can go out there and mark anyone, you know, um, really could build you up, you know, he could tear you down, but he could build you up, like, that's, that's the, that was the, the thing with him, you know, so, he, uh, I'll never forget the Armagh match in, in 2004, so Pierce McKenna was sent off after, like, 47 seconds for, 
um, swiping at Francie Pellew and missing him essentially. <laughs> Pellew died, rolled around. Uh, Pierce got the line and we played the whole game with, with 14 men and we had them on the ropes until late in the game. And like, this is the team that had won the All-Ireland in 2002, had lost the Ireland final in 2003 and here they were in Ulster semi-final and half time he could, you know, there was philosophical conversation going on as to what way the tactical thing should go and yeah. Uh, I was uh, just standing in one corner of the room, kind of l- listening into them, and they had uh, they had arranged to go with you know one plan, and at the last second they had basically gone and told the players what was going on, and then at the last second Coleman turned around and was like, no, this is what we're going to do, and he just made a decision, completely different decision. I think he said bring on two subs. He brought on Michael Brides and he brought on Shane Cole, and he was like, Brides will will run the ball and create the overlap, and he goes Shane Cole will tread the ball through a needle. And sure enough, we got the ball up the field, even though we were a man down, we kept getting the ball up the field with those two lads giving and going from Michael Brides and Shane Cole hitting crossfield passes and just our man were at sixes and sevens to deal with this, even though they had a, they had a spare, man, so, spare man. So it was just that kind of thing where he was tactically, he was strong uh, and he was very good at people, well, knowing lads' personalities and what to do, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I often think that him getting sick in, uh, 05 was was uh sorry in 06 was really set us back because um you know sorry in 05 he got sick yeah he got sick through through the summer of 05 and and then passed away he really set us back because he was building something at that time with that group of players and uh yeah. that kind of kind of kind of evaporated then over the next couple of years you know and there were a few kind of years where we kind of lost our way a little bit and uh, just unfortunate, you know, because he, he had control of everyone, you know, he really had everyone buying into what was going on and building something, you know, so that's probably, when I look back at my county career, it's probably Eamon getting sick is is one of the biggest uh, disappointments, I suppose, um, in, in, in terms of, of uh, my time with Cavan. Definitely making it you said, like an absolute legend. And I suppose like when we when we did have um Eamon there, like do you feel we maybe underachieved when he was there, or like we could achieve a lot more, like and we did definitely have the panel of players, Mickey. Yeah, I mean I remember the following year, like oh five, we got to the final twelve, uh, we got to the last twelve, yeah, and the following year I think we picked up so Darren Rabbit had been playing full back and he injured his uh, knee. Um, Anthony Ford, I think, might have picked up an injury or maybe he got a uh, suspension or something. I can't remember, but I remember looking at the team. Michal Ling got sick and Jared Pearson had injured his cruciate. So when you went through the team, we basically lost the full back, the centre back, the I think we lost the midfielder, the centre forward, and the full forward of the, of the previous year. So you lost the entire spine of your team. And we were still, yeah. you know, on the brink of getting promoted to Division One, and then I suppose that Waterford game came along where we lost to Waterford, and yeah, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. we had ourselves promoted. And the uh, for whatever reason, a bunch of players were played against Waterford. So you're already missing the spine of your team, and then if you take out another spine of it, like that's the thing that often is forgotten about that game is, you know, you're missing the spine from the previous year, and then another bunch of changes were made because. It was assumed we were gonna gonna beat them, and you just, you know, it, it, you maybe you'd actually get away with that in round one or round two of the league. But but when you get to round seven, you know, a lot of players haven't played much football tr- over the course of the previous two or three months, and suddenly to throw them all in in round seven and expect a performance isn't probably fair in them, you know. Um, and then on top of that, Waterford had one of those days where they put points over from they put about four points over from outside the forty fives that were just spectacular scores that you low percentage shots that you wouldn't expect again, you know, so that was a real kick in the stones, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, so that whole period just kind of, it could have been something something special and it, it didn't happen, you know, because um, we, we played in 05, we played Tyrone and drew with them, they got to the Ireland final and won it that year and I remember chatting to some lads, some of that Tyrone team afterwards, five or six years afterwards, and they said that 
that first day out, they, they were on the ropes. <laughs> they were not yeah. expecting what, what hit them that day, you know? Uh, so, yeah. Look, you always look back and I suppose that, in, that year in 05, I really got a huge buzz out of it. And you nearly spend the rest of your career chasing that buzz again. The crowds in Clonus, the packed crowds and the atmospheres and, you know, didn't really kind of experience that again, you know, not to the same level. You had big days out and stuff, but it wasn't the same. Um, same buzz wasn't around, you know. So, um, yeah, look, it was what it was, you know. It, it petered out the way it petered out for me, I suppose. And you feel maybe obviously when Eamon Dicka kind of sick and then I think it was your last year playing for the Calvin Footballers 2010, Mickey? Yeah, so... To, uh, Cork, Cork, it was wasn't a, it? A hanking on their way to winning the All Ireland, yeah, down in Cork. You, you were marking one of my pundits, uh, Daniel Goulden. <laughs> Daniel Goulden, yeah, you can tell Daniel, and I was the only player to keep him scoreless from play that year. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will, he, don't worry. He kicked the point in the in the last minute of the All Ireland final from play, or maybe the last two or three minutes in the All Ireland final uh, from play. So. <laughs> That meant he scored he scored from playing every game except except that day against us. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So I actually seen Daniel. I was coaching DIT Sigerson team in o uh, o eight, sorry o nine. I think it was the Sigerson final was played down in Cork in CIT, and uh, Daniel had been playing that day, and he kicked over. I don't know, he kicked over seven or eight frees. Um, did he miss one? Maybe he missed one the whole day. <laughs> it was heartbreaking stuff. He was so accurate. Uh, so accurate with the freeze, yeah. But uh, I suppose also there was, when Kilgan's first year came in, and Kilgan was, was kind of building something, I have to say, but he I pulled the plug in it a little bit early as well, you know. He was certainly developing as a manager too. He came in with a good background team, and... Uh, then I think Paul Grimley went for the Armagh job and didn't get it. And then Kilgan said, well, he kind of said, you can't come back to us now that you've kind of went for that Armagh job. And Paul had been in as a coach. To be honest, I, I don't know. I'm assuming, I, I don't know what way the conversation went, but when Paul went for the Armagh job, he, he didn't turn back up in Cavan. So we had to put together a new backroom team the second year. And uh, it was kind of possibly maybe a little bit rushed. And definitely, I would say, Donald improved as a manager over those two years, but maybe the backroom didn't improve as much. Um, like we had Julie Davis doing in doing our S and C work uh, the first year with, with with Paul and Donald, and uh, she she had been with Armagh when they won the All Ireland, and um, again it's that consistency of approach. It just left us. Um, you know, if Judy had been staying, we probably would have had essence threat and condition work done all through that summer and all through that winter. Instead, there's a complete break. Nobody knows what's going on. Players are left to their own devices. Um, you know, you left to fend for yourself. You either have access to facilities or you don't. And back then, lads didn't in the county. So, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of things that you look back on and you, you go, well, you know, um, certainly most counties this you know, these days don't have to deal with, with with that stuff. They have their structures in place, you know. But uh, yeah, no. So that that that's probably the second thing I'd, I'd I'd have regrets about is the fact that we didn't get two, three years, let's say, with Donal and uh, Paul Grimley and, and and Julie that 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 thing got broken up after a year as well because you could see certainly the th there was improvement uh, being made there, not just. And the development of players, but also in the style, we were beginning to play nice football at times as well over that period, I thought, you know. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're probably the two periods I'd, I'd look back on. I don't know, the final couple of years with Tommy Carr, I don't know if, I think, I always look back on, on, on the panel and I think it was probably getting slightly weaker every year from 05 on, maybe, sorry, not from 05, well, 05, yeah, and probably not, not fair to say from 05 on. It was fairly strong in 06, even though, no, yeah, it was probably 05 on. We, we peaked as a group of players, I'd say, in my time. Uh, yeah. Then improved a little bit around 07 and 08, and then maybe dipped again then uh, 09 and 2010, you know. So, uh, 
I suppose the county like Cavan has to, uh, you know, accept that there, there will come kind of peaks and troughs. You know, you 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 should probably aim to be get up to Division One, and when you get there, stay there for maybe three years and cycle back down to Division Two for maybe three or four years and cycle back up to Division One because it's very hard for a county like that to sustain a long period of time. Um, you know, you look at Monaghan and what they're doing, but um, I think Monaghan, Monaghan have, uh, because they've stayed in Division One so many times, it's, it's took a lot out of them by the time it comes to championship every year. I think that they would have been better served in terms of championship. Just let themselves cycle down so that they're not, they're going through Division Two, and it's not like every game is an All-Ireland final the way it is at, in Division One, you know? They they can probably be they could have for example rested Connor McManus for a number of games in Division Two if they had ever gone down and you can see him he he's played a lot a lot of games from on him with, with with injured hips and with, with different injuries and stuff like that so yeah Cavan like county like Cavan that that should probably be the the aim is get up to Division One for a few years cycle down for a few years get back up go down maybe be able to clear up injuries to a few key players and go back up then and stuff like that rather than sustain it because it's it's tough even so with Mayo there they introduced a bunch of players down they went but they they uh, came back up or whatever you know so yeah it's it's, it's difficult to, to for even a big county to 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 do that you know Making. Obviously, when you're in, we're finishing up after uh, uh, ten. What was maybe the decision behind it all? Was it injuries, uh, loss of interest, or what was the kind of the, the final moment for yourself? Yeah, well, Val Val came in, Val Andrews, and I was I got diagnosed with osteitis pubis. So at the time, I suppose anybody that got osteitis pubis, it's one of those injuries that they, people didn't really understand what it was, other than it was a, a groin injury, but. Uh, a lot of the time what they did is you're told to rest for 10, 10 months and then hopefully inflammation dies away or reduces in that area and then you can come back. And oftentimes what happens is people come back and they get the injury back again within six to six to eight weeks. So I was kind of in one of those situations where I didn't really know what was going to happen. So I had osteitis pubis. I started training with the, with the panel and then around November, I was getting a lot of pain in my groin. and. Bear in mind, it was mostly gym work we were doing at the time. Yeah. So I was told to take a break for a little while, see what happens. So I was coaching the Sigerson team in um, DIT and Val rang me up and he said, listen, <laughs> he said, look, you know, you're coaching the team there. Does You obviously know a little bit something about football. If you're coaching a Sigerson team at your age, you have a bit about you. Be wrong for us not to kind of keep you involved in the group to see what we can get out of you while you're while you're injured and to see uh maybe you can get your injury right and all that kind of stuff and i was like yeah no problem val that's that's fine and then uh three weeks later i got a phone call from val they were cutting the panel and val was like uh you know you're always injured <laughs> some turn around you know so whatever i was like fair enough val <laughs> I mean, I, I literally didn't he's know. A lovely, if I was gonna... He's a lovely fella, Mickey. He's a, he's a lovely fella. <laughs> oh, well, I, I didn't know if I was going to play football in 10 months. Like, I, I didn't know. I was getting a lot of groin pain. So, I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't going to... Um, I was kind of open to the fact that I, I probably needed a year off to figure out what was going out. Uh, and then, as it turns out, I uh, I went and got in touch with End the, End the King. And uh, in terms of... Sorting out groins, and it's a phenomenal physio, and and had me had me fixed up, and uh, I actually played then. I played football that year in summer of 2011. I was back playing football with uh, with the club, and uh, I was pain free. And we won the title, the junior title. The, we won the intermediate, the intermediate, that intermediate year. Yeah, won the intermediate. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, beat crushed. On account line. nearly being dropped, you had a big year, probably, was it? No, no, because I, I I wouldn't say I played. I was still struggling with my fitness, like because I had I took so long off that I came back. I'd say I was kind of carrying weight and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't, you know, I was getting stronger as the year was going on, but I was kind of having to watch my training load, um, and uh, wouldn't say I was playing brilliant or anything. I mean, it was I played all right, like, but uh, yeah, we won the intermediate, but. Uh, didn't 
Terry came in the following year. I can't remember when Terry came in. I know it was probably March of the following year, but Val didn't anyway. Val decided that after he had dropped, let's say, whatever, me and whatever group of players he dropped, the following year was the year, the following uh, winter was the year he dropped Shawnee Johnston and Mickey Ling and Dermot Churd and, and a whole bunch of lads. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wasn't involved in that call. <laughs> <laughs> I often slag the boys. We we not mention we not mention one man that had struggled with that uh, phone call, uh, Mickey, will we? <laughs> <laughs> so I I wasn't involved in that call. I I had been previously the previous year because of my Australian Cubus. So when he when he called all of those lads, he was obviously deciding to go in a new direction, and he wasn't picking up the phone and ringing me back up again. I suppose you know. So uh, yeah, and off off he went anyway with, with his. Uh, with his new group of panel, group, uh, with his new panel, and then Terry came in, and Terry, but well, Terry came in, then uh, took over from Val, and Terry had been with under twenty ones, and that was it. Terry wasn't gonna was was gonna push the the under twenty one players that he had, and at that stage, I suppose I was pushing thirty. So I mean, I was, I had, I, I, I have to say that like, uh, hand on heart. I don't know if I'd ever, if I got called back, would I have gone back? Because you look at, uh, like, it's one thing to be, I was in that kind of county bubble from I was, you know, 17 slash 18 until I was, you know, 27 slash 28. And you know nothing else. But suddenly when you're out of it and you can do stuff, like Paddy's Week came and I was able to go away for a weekend, like with the girlfriend at the time. And I remember thinking, this is weird. <laughs> You have time yeah, to do things yeah. that you never had to do before, like you're not under pressure. Not your whole day, your whole week isn't scheduled out for you. You have to be here. You have to be there. Your family, for example, all have to be quiet after like half nine on a Saturday night because you have a Sunday game. And I'm an extremely light sleeper, yeah. so the, the people in my life were making sacrifices for me to play county football, and I kind of was like going, "Oh, I've, it's they've done enough. Like you know, I need to." And yeah, like yeah. I'm. I'm talking about being an extremely light sleeper, like literally a little thing waking me up. And if I if I I was in that situation where I would fall asleep and if I woke up after an hour, that was me done. I wasn't getting back to sleep. And then you're having to deal with that, that you're tired because you haven't slept properly. You've got the game coming on, your, your mind would be racing. Um, and it, I was just like, right, now this is just too much anxiety for <laughs> all my family around all these little things. So I was like, I've, yeah. I don't know. I, when you've... I often admire the player that plays county football, goes away and comes back into it because, you yeah. know. And there's lots of them, Mickey. There's lots of them. That's the real psychopath because <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they know the freedom of not being involved, you know. They, they understand the commitment, yeah. they walk away from it and then they come back to it like it's, it, it is a big commitment, you know. So, um, yeah. yeah, so like, I, I don't know what I've ever gone back to it. Now, when Matthew McLean came in, I was playing club football in Monaghan, so he'd come from managing Scotstown, yeah. and uh, I think he was humming and hawing about bringing me back in, uh, but it, it didn't materialise for one reason or the other. I suppose it was, at that stage, I was writing for the anglo Celt, and again, I don't know if I'd have gone in, because, um, you know, you've been writing about this group of players for five or six years at that stage, and, you know, I don't know how, how that would have worked. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, look, I enjoyed the years I did it, and I think 10 years is enough for, for, for most people, you know, unless you have, there's other things you want to do with your life and your time, you know, and, um, yeah. you know, if, if it, it, like, I suppose I would look back at it now, and I would say to anyone that is involved that you need to take care of your career and all those other things uh, as well. You need to make sure that you're, you're ticking all those boxes, that you're not just solely focused on the football. Because you can get to the point that where that seems to be doing that. There is, 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 is the awareness got a bit better in recent years, Mickey? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose I can only look at the at the Longford panel now, and they're so young that none of them are thinking. Like most of them are still students or whatever, you know. So, like I, I would say that it's important that they you start looking at maybe some of the older lads and pull them aside and say, well, you know what, start having these conversations about their career. Are they happy with their career? Have they got a pension, for example, like such a simple thing like that? Start trying to get them involved with yeah. financial planners and stuff like this, so that they're not they're not just solely focused 
on the county football. It's taken up all of their time and that they neglect other areas of their life um, because it, 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 it can be all consuming, you know, it, it is all consuming that you, that you need probably to start looking at things. And that's where, the, I mean, the GPA, I don't know why the GPA comes in for such a bad rep and some people just have a thing about them where they, they just have the dagger out for them. But like the GPA do great work with, with, with players uh, with regard to career development and all that kind of stuff. And that's important because, you know, it's very easy to get involved in the county panel and then let it consume you and become an obsession. And then you end up, you know, some manager comes in and just says, right, nah, don't fancy it, good luck. And suddenly it's like, hold on, what have I got left here now? I haven't developed my career. I'm at this point in my life now where I should have all my ducks in a row. I look around at my, all my friends and they've all got moved on with their careers and their lives and they've got houses and mortgages and you know, I don't know what a tracker mortgage is. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you don't want players in that situation. You have to facilitate county football and, um, you know, the GP, I think, do great work with that regard. And I, I, I wonder when sometimes when I see former players talk about the GPA negatively, is it just the bitterness maybe, or what is driving that? Because Lack of knowledge, Mickey, I'd say. Yeah, it, do, it just doesn't add up to me, you know, it just it just doesn't add up. Like, if they, what you what you want is the best players playing in every county. Surely that's what everybody wants. Like, if you want the best games, even if, if I'm a Cavan man and we're playing our local rivals in Monaghan or Mead, I want the best Cavan team to beat the best Mead team or the best, best Monaghan team. That's what I really want. I don't want Cavan to beat the Monaghan team and Monaghan missing their 10 best players because they haven't committed for whatever reason. I want to see the best players from every county playing each other at the highest standard that, that they can get. So that needs to be facilitated um, rather than, and if the GPA are, are helping that happen by through educational programs and through uh, whatever else they do, stuff that they run, career development and all that kind of stuff, then, then I think it's, it's to be lauded rather than ran down by, uh, by, by uh, people in the media. So I, I, I can't really understand that. I, you know they talk about the funding but you know they get this money from the from central central uh, you know they get it directly from crow park whatever amount of money they get to fund themselves so what you know it's not like they're you know they're spending it on what i see to be uh good causes and good 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 you know money is spent wisely like so um talk about oh is, is it money should be going towards the coaching all that stuff yes money should go towards coaching but money goes towards coaching and games and development this is an important part of, of the the ga uh it's not the be all and the end all the intercounty game far from it but i know it's the game i most enjoy watching like the games i love watching the summer are, let's say you know dublin against Kerry and dublin against mayo and you know the big teams playing each other and like I enjoy watching intercounty games, so yes, let's kind of make sure that it's as strong as it can be, and without it being to the detriment of the club game. And I don't, I, I don't think the GPA of, uh, you know, a play, play a role in in that. So I, I think they play a strong role in promoting the the intercounty thing. I think it should be, should be lauded, you know. Definitely, Mickey. Definitely. So it's the last few, Mickey. You've been you've been brilliant with your time. Uh, a question I'd like to ask you: Did you did you enjoy the kind of media work you did do, obviously with the Celt and We Are Cavan and bits and pieces like that, Mickey? When you did kind of step away from the county panel? Yeah, I suppose it kind of kept you involved in the intercounty scene in in a level um, that you probably I probably would have drifted away from some of the stuff that I enjoyed doing if I hadn't been writing for the paper. Like you know, I I like watching games. I like analysing games, uh, but. You know, if I hadn't been doing that, I don't know if I would have done as much of it as I have done, you know. I think it's actually helped me in terms of coaching, in terms of being on the sideline and, and reading situations, because when you're, like, the kind of work I was doing was analysis. Uh, yes, it was a column, but I was basically analysing games. And, you know, you kind of, the more times, like, you can go and watch a game, switch off and watch a game, or you can go and watch a game really tuned into it. Yeah. And I was doing that every week, you know, for for, for the paper and then for, for uh, We Are Calvin. So I think it's actually, it's just one of those things. I think it might have helped me as well in terms of coaching that on the sideline, being able to, to read a game as well, you know. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I was, it was, you know, I'd say it's something that I've got better at 
just by practicing a lot, you know. So, yeah, I, I'll tell you, I won't, what I won't miss is sitting down on the Sunday to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the weeks there were no matches and you're sitting down and you're going, oh, right. God, I know, I know, I know, I know. What will I write about? It's time consuming again. So, again, enjoyed it while I did it, but I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, at the same time, I'm happy to have my time back, you know, because it, it's uh, you travel to a game sometime and then you travel back and then, you know, you could be driving on your own and you can't really start work until you start typing until you get back. You know, it's not it's different if you're doing a report. I see the guys doing the reports at the games and they're they're writing away as they're going as things are going on, who scored a point, what happened, and suppose that's very different to analysis in the column that I was doing. You needed to sit down after watching the game and. Uh, and 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 do your analysis, you know, and to pick out the key points. So enjoy it, but enjoy having the little bit of time <laughs> I have back yeah. now from it. So yeah, yeah, it was it was good. I just don't know how Sean done it for thirty five years. I really don't. So I, I, I'll have to double ask him ask him about that again, Mickey. Uh, yeah. Another few. Um, your current setup, uh, Bally Bay, uh, Pierce Oaks down in Monaghan. There, are you enjoying that setup at the minute, uh, Mickey? Still playing? Yeah, still playing, looking forward to it. Yeah, another year, I'll give it another go. Split season, I suppose, allows me to, to, to play it. Probably, I'll take it every year now as it comes. Will I will I play uh, for much longer? I don't know. I kind of always thought the body would retire me. Uh, but here I am, all these years later, still playing and the body's okay. So I, I, I'll probably, if the body doesn't retire me, it, there'll probably come a time where I'll just decide I want to do other things with my time. That day comes. Uh, I know. Hopefully, I'll I'll know. Hopefully, I get to retire on my terms rather than be forced to retire. You know. But, um, yeah. Look, I have to say, I suppose arriving down in Bally Bay at thirty-one years of age, and suddenly you feel like you have to prove yourself all over again. You know, it probably in some ways has prolonged my career. Um. By having that kind of fresh challenge at that 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 stage, so um, yeah, look, it's it's been enjoyable, very enjoyable, and I have to say, club football in Monaghan is it's played like the senior club football in Monaghan is a brilliant standard of football to play. You know, you have essentially all the county players are congregated at ten clubs, uh, so any day you go out to play, you always have maybe you know, three county players on one team against three county players on another team, you know, just to, to, while you find in Calvin that the county players are spread out over 40 clubs. So you might go out to see a game and there might only be one county player on each team playing or no county players so, sometimes, you know, so the standard is is, is strong. Um, it, it, it's it's good football, good football to play, you know, it's, uh, it satisfies that competitive edge. You, you still have to fire, competitive fire still burn away inside anyway, so I'll keep doing it for a while there, yeah. 100%, 100%. Obviously, kind of making that jump from Cavan to Monaghan, like, was the standard kind of up or was it kind of at the same level, at, at the same as Cavan? No, no, the, same, the senior football is, like, like in Cavan at the time, there were 16 or 17 clubs, I think, senior, while in in Monaghan there was 10. So, you know, you, you, the, the, the congregation of players was much stronger. Like you could you could go out and you could have two teams playing in, in the in the senior league. Sorry, that was the other thing. At the time, obviously COVID has changed everything, but at the time the league relegated you in Monaghan. So, you know, every league game was very important because you didn't want to get to the end of the year and you could be in the championship final, but you could be about to get relegated as well for the following year. So there was huge emphasis put 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 on the league. Well, I see in Calvin there, the league is played, but nobody really, you know, you miss a game or whatever it is, or it's it's not a big deal. So the structures could could maybe change a little bit. Like, and Calvin could are, are missing a trick there by not having the league and championship linked. So the, there's a lot of league games in Calvin that are meaningless. Essentially, it doesn't really, it, you know, they're not played at a at a high standard. Guys just kind of go out and play play games to fulfil fixtures, uh, but in Monaghan it's it's different. Like every league game matters because you don't want to get relegated, you know. So there is that as well. So yeah. it's it's one of those things. Now obviously COVID has changed things a little bit this year. The championship structures have changed uh, this year, and they changed last year because of COVID. They changed the year because the year before because of COVID as well. So yeah, but like Cavan have kind of done things as well. So I, I what. 
Cavan, I think that the overall standard on Cavan has, ri- has risen over the last two or three years in particular, without maybe the top team being way much way better than you know we don't have the Cavan Gales team of you know the mid mid two thousands. We don't have that outstanding team. We have a lot of very good teams that yeah. are all kind of their levels is increasing every year. You know, Rammer seems to have gone up a little bit. Crush Law have gone up over the last three or four years. Um, so it's plus they've gone down to twelve teams versus the seventeen that they had when I when I changed county. So like, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I suppose the, the real way to know is if Cavan and Monaghan drew each other in the Ulster Club, you get to see the champions of Cavan playing the champions of, of Monaghan. Uh, you you get to see the the difference in standard or to see the 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 standards then you know so. Yeah, but it's it's good. It's yeah. it's definitely it's good football. You know, it's it's hard. The refereeing is different as well. <laughs> the refereeing is <laughs> the refereeing is different. Like, uh, you know, it's it's a physical a physical game, a very physical game, hard hitting. Um, so you know, if you don't mind that, uh, you know, you're, you'd be more than welcome over there. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff, Mickey. Brilliant stuff. And uh, last, very, very last two, and this is probably a very relevant question because obviously your work you do and obviously coach and teach and everything, Mickey. Does the young kind of Mickey Hannon trying to make the breakthrough um, around the around the country to make that next level? What advice would you give them? I suppose kind of life advice, football advice, and just to make that next break, Mickey. Yeah, uh, well, if I was doing it all again now, I I really, really, really focus on stuff like nutrition and. Uh, focus on the the if you're involved in a county panel you the time you have to work on stuff like your skills for example you, you don't get that in, in with a county panel because so much of your time is spent working on tactical game plans and stuff like that so i would focus on th- things like nutrition really have my nutrition dialed down and i'd really focus then on my own time working on skills um, because you just don't really, it's hard to squeeze that that time for skill development in into county panel of play, you know, like it's, the, your time is squeezed. With amateur players, the amount of time you have is is uh, is, is small. And, and the last thing is, it's very important, like young lads when they're 18, 19, 20, up to 25, that's such a huge opportunity, a huge window for them to develop physically because you know, their hormone levels are at, you know, peak testosterone, all that kind of stuff that if they're in the gym and, and consistent over those years, what you'll find is you have an opportunity to not just reach peak performance in your, you know, 26, 27 years, those years, but you have an opportunity to build yourself such a robust sort of strong body that you can be injury free and play well into your 30s. And um, so like th- those are the things I'd say really focus on, on, on those things like individually when you have time look to do extra skill work and uh, obviously be consistent with the with the strength and conditioning work and then really consistent with the diet because the better your diet is like the better your diet is the, the easier the training is if you're not carrying weight it's very easy to train to train without having to you know it's just easier on your body. You're not always fighting a battle. So those are the things I, 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 I'd suggest. Those three things that you kind of look at doing. Um, and just enjoy the thing because it, it goes like that. It goes like that so quickly. You don't realise how quickly it goes. I mean, I'm still playing away. I'm the exception now to be playing at turn. I'm about to turn 39 and I'm, I suppose I'm the exception now. I look at all my friends and that I played under age football but none of them are playing really bar maybe one one guy. So. Yeah, it, it, you have to enjoy it, and it's not just the game you have to enjoy. You have to enjoy the process as well, all those other things as well. You have to, you have to enjoy it, you know. Super stuff, Mickey. Super stuff. And very last one, nice easy one to finish up with. Who would be the best player you played with and the toughest player you played against? And don't say Brian Bates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, that's a good one. That's not a. <laughs> You could have warned me about that one. I have to think about that now. <laughs> I definitely the 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 best player I I ever coached was Jeremy Connolly. Like this oh, guy. I mean, I I didn't play with Jeremy because 
I coached the Sigerson team the year after I graduated and uh, Connolly, he is like, there's very few players I would pay money to see, right? But I definitely would have paid money every week to watch Connolly play and I definitely would have played money every week to watch Kieran McDonald play. And yeah. like, I mean, Connolly was... Connie was a special player. I could see the training. Just he moves, he, he moves with a grace with the ball that rarely I, I've seen since. You know, he often remind me of that quote Alex Ferguson talked about Ryan Giggs when he saw him playing. You know, oh yeah, and uh, just it, it had the same thing when I when I watched Jeremy training and the way he moves. He was just so graceful with the ball, left foot, right foot, so balanced. And then on top of that, yes. you see a player like that, but. There was uh, underneath the hood. There was a serious, serious, uh, serious athlete as well, like real, real powerful, powerful, naturally powerful uh, athlete. Um, and then uh, I mean I wrote about this before, but Stephen McDonnell in two thousand five was he hit levels that year that very few players at forwards in, in Ulster hit since you know. Probably his career was ravaged with injury th thereafter, and we only sporadically saw what he was capable of. But um, in 05, he was he was phenomenal, you know, left foot, right foot, and again one of those players that was so well technically balanced and poised, left foot, right foot didn't matter. Dummy solos with both feet, kick with both feet, pass with both feet. Um, I suppose the difference in him and, and Condi is he, he wasn't, like Jeremy was a real special athlete in terms of physical power. Um, Stephen O'Neill was was brilliant, like, you know, he was a brilliant athlete, but Condi is so, was something special. Like when you see Condi up close at hand, how, how good he was, you know. Um, so yeah, they're, they're probably the two. I never played with Condi, but I, I, I saw him in, in, up, uh, obviously, um, managing the Sigerson team in DIT. I mean, any of the cap lads to play with or Tr Trump Gearing lads or any of just to play with or uh, uh, let me see. Um uh, probably uh in Drum Goon Keith Fallon was was very good, you know. Still plays still too, playing, still yeah, playing. yeah. Still playing there, yeah. Keith again had a huge soccer background, so he was a lovely striker of the ball as well, you know. Um, and Calvin, ah, uh, look, Peter Riley, Derwent McCabe, uh, Shawnee, Shawnee, they were all exceptional players, you know. Um, I, I can tell you probably the most underrated player I played with uh, was Cahill Collins. He was any day Cahill wasn't playing, and even I'd say Calvin Gale's lads would say this if you asked. Any day Cahill isn't playing, you, you definitely noticed it. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, very underrated player. Probably one of those lads that didn't do the spectacular, but he did everything he did. He did it better than everyone else. Like you know, quite uh, yeah, yeah. Just did the simple things to such a high level, um, and you know, a real kind of. Sticky defender as well when he had to play in the fence. He could, and he could play anywhere too. He could play in the forward line or play midfield or play in the full back line, centre back, wherever it was. Could play everywhere, you know. There we go. Mickey Hannon, thanks a million for joining me this week. Uh, that was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I, I finally got around to it. But uh, yeah, thanks a million, Mickey. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by orgoretcha.com and Attack to D. He's your role coach, Mac podcast to get 15% off at orgoretcha.com and get the best skins, gloves, equipment on Attack to D. Be attack minded. And if you like what you're seeing, like and subscribe on YouTube because the sport's been absolutely brilliant so far. Mickey, have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Thanks, John.